Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Gosh, how wonderful to see such a crowded theater. We're actually in overflow capacity. Um, so welcome, welcome. I'm glad you're here. I see a good number of faces who were here last night for our opening festivities. And apparently we're so enamored, we're so captivated, they need to come uh, back and hear from our exceptional ar artist, Preston Singletary, today. Um, I'm Patricia McDonald, director of the Wichita Art Museum. Really pleased that we get to welcome all of you here um, and to experience such an extraordinary artist and such an innovative, very different kind of gallery presentation as Preston Singletary, Raven, and the Box of Daylight. The Museum of Glass organized this project with Preston, but they also engaged a very talented, and we've discovered quite lovely, guest curator, Dr. Miranda Bellarde Lewis. They both are here um, for the weekend uh, for the opening from Seattle. Um, Miranda worked to, there, there are many different narratives in the story of the Raven in Clinket culture, and um, uh, Miranda worked to find a through line, that, an acceptable through line, to be able to pr present the story um, in this gallery experience. We're missing Juniper Shui this afternoon, another you know, incredible mind and talent from the Seattle area. Juniper was the multimedia artist that worked with Preston to create all that sound and projection and just you know, raises it all to this other incredible immersive experience. I want to acknowledge um, our wonderful great friends from across the street, the Mid-America All Indian Center, um, have loved working with April Scott and Erin Rao. I know April is here, here she is, uh, and Erin I, I, was here last night, I didn't see her yet today. At any rate, that is the center director and the museum director, respectively. Um, and I want to acknowledge Christina Burke, who's taking notes over here on the side of the auditorium, who's from the Philbrook Museum of Art in Tulsa. She is their curator of Native American art, and she will be back here on Thursday evening. Please come to hear um, her talk. At any rate, we love collaboration, and we love all these collaborators. Um, many understood the significance of this project, um, an exhibition, and they stepped forward to help our museum make this happen for all of you and for the city of Wichita. So please have some patience and bear with me as I recognize the people who are supporters of this exhibition. The presenting sponsor is the F. Price Cosman Memorial Trust, situated at Interest Bank. Lead patrons are the DeVore Foundation and Judy Slauson. The Fred and Mary Koch Foundation supplied additional, very important underwriting. Charles Baker is a principal sponsor. Emprise Bank is a substantial corporate sponsor. Generous support also came from Louise Barron, the Berry Foundation, Donna Bunk, Mary Eves, Norma Griever, Dr. Dennis and Mrs. Ann Ross, Mary Sue Smith, Sarah T. Smith, the Wiedemann Foundation, Janice and Jeff N. Sickle, Sue and Kurt Watson. And then there were more. Additional exhibition patrons include Dr. John and Nancy Bramer, Sharon and Dr. Alan Fury, Tony and Bud Gates, Carol and Guy Glidden, Patty Gorham and Jeff Kennedy, Sonia Gretemann and Chris Brunner, Trish Higgins, Mary and Delmar Clucky, Mary Lynn and Bill Oliver, Will and Christian uh, Price. And all the museums, or all the exhibitions at our museum are generously supported as well by the city of uh, Wichita and the friends of the Wichita Art Museum. So praise and thanks, and let's give a little applause to these very generous <laughs> So this afternoon, uh, Preston is speaking, but it's gonna be a little bit of a Ginger and Rogers, <laughs> or fr friend Ginger, rather, combination. Uh, Dr. Miranda Bellarde Lewis is, is also going to join in. Um, she is an assistant professor in the information school at the University of Washington, and her focus there is on North American indigenous knowledge. 
She's an independent curator as well as a university professor, and so she worked on uh, this particular project. But just of note, she um, was a, a, an essayist. She contributed a chapter to Princeton University, their art museum, uh, worked on, created an exhibition and a related scholarly publication, and she contributed a chapter to a book called Nature's Nation, American Art and Environment that came out last year by Yale University Press, so um, quite a person of import. Seattle and the Pacific Northwest is an incredible epicenter for glass art, and I'm not sure if all of us in the room are entirely aware of that, so to emphasize, um, uh, Preston Singletary found his training um, not only in Seattle, but really from the very best. He cr credits um, sort of early beginnings and sort of launching him in the career with relationships with other glass artists that he has, Dante Marioni and Benjamin Moore in particular, both incredibly, incredibly accomplished artists. And he has a critical connection to the Pilchuck Glass School, not a school, I, I don't know if all of you are aware of it, but is situated in the woods outside of the Seattle area and was founded by um, Dale Chihuly, the artist that did um, our chandelier. At any rate, um, single Terry started there as a student, and then he became an apprentice, and then he became a teacher, and now he's a board member. He also went for training to Sweden, to Costa Boda, and along the way he's found both incredible training and mentorship by the Italian glass masters Lino Tagli Pietra and Pino Signoretti. He's found critical success and really raves around the world at this point with exhibitions here, there, and everywhere. He's collected at, in the British Museum in London and other museums in France and Sweden and in the National Museum of Scotland, in the United States, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Museum of Art and Design in New York, the Smithsonian, and leading museums in Detroit, Denver, and Phoenix, everywhere up and down the West Coast from Los Angeles to Seattle, but actually to Anchorage. So I'm telling you all the way up and down the West Coast. Um, he is the recipient in 2003 of Corning Museum of Glass honor the Rakow Commission. And in 2010, the University of Puget Sound awarded him an honorary doctorate. We're so fortunate that Wichita was able to gain the, a, a layover is one of the things I've been calling this. This is an exhibition that opened um, in Tacoma at the Museum of Glass. It's um, now in Wichita, and its next stop on the national tour is the Smithsonian Institution. Let's welcome Preston to the podium and Miranda as well. Thank you very much. Um, so this was an opportunity. I want to thank you know the, the Patricia and Tara and everybody, uh, all the staff involved with uh, the museum here. And it's been uh, the show looks great. I'm really pleased with it, and uh, I'm glad it could be here. Uh, and I'm grateful for you all to come out here and uh, hear us speak. I figured this was an opportunity for. Uh, for Miranda since she was here for us to, and we haven't done this before like in the at least in this kind of a format We've done it as a walkthrough. So we've got some notes here We're going to tell the story and we're going to get into the symbolism and the you know some things that we learned along the way um, as we put the show together, so just uh, like that, you know throw out those those uh, thank yous and the uh, chish is what we would say in, in Clinket. That's our word for thank you. Uh, I know that Miranda has some acknowledgments too, so I'll let you we'll go. Okay. We'll knock it over to your court. <laughs> We've been instructed to share the mic, and we're getting pretty good at it. Um, good afternoon. Shkik yuhat tawasak yeis nahatati taktin tan ayahat. Uh, Zuni Pueblo Yadi, Filipino Dashkan Ayahat. Um, look at our um, um, Wichita dot Kansa dot Ka on Ulak Nawe, Seisho Emma Getsana. So, um, good afternoon. My name is Miranda. My clinket name is Shkik. 
I'm a daughter of a Zuni man and a Clinket woman. My, my Clinket clan is Duckdane Tan, which is of the Raven side of the Clinket nation. Um, I'm also the grandchild of a Filipino. And I'd like to acknowledge the Wichita, the Kanza, and the Ka people, the original peoples of this land. And that was a really important part for us um, as we opened um, in, in Puyallup territory when this first opened at the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, and that's on Puyallup lands and waters. And so it was a really important part of the process, and so I was so glad to see the Native community here last night and to be able for Preston to reciprocate the song, which is a very Native uh, way of living and being. And so it's all about those partnerships and all about the ways that we can learn from each other and the way that we can recognize each other's humanity and who we are as individuals, but how our philosophies, our identities, and our ways of being in the world are really formed by our community. And so we are just so thrilled to be able to be here. We thank the Museum of Glass for all of their support, all of their, their guidance, all of their way of reining us back in as we were dreaming. Like, this is a very refined version of what we wanted to do. Um, but um, you know, with their support and guidance, and uh, we were able to create this in a collaborative way. And so we're just very excited to share the story with you. So I thought I would start with a little bit. I think the, one, the first time we met was at NMAI opening, correct? Mm -hmm. It was 2004. Um, the National Museum of the American Indian uh, is the native museum that's on the mall at the, in Washington, D.C. It's the next destination for this exhibition. Um, anyway, so I was there in 2004, and Miranda and I met, but I also met a man named Walter Porter, who was a Clinkett elder who, um, who uh, a, good, a mutual friend of ours, well, actually your relation, uh, Clarissa, Resolve. She decided. She said, "You have to come meet this person, and I, you know, I want you to get to know him." And so I met Walter, and he'd seen my piece of uh, the Raven with the sun in its beak, and he was really. Uh, and he says, "You know, that's my life story. That's my life's work. My life's. Uh, uh, you know, I've been uh, analyzing mythologies for." Um, you know, taking the Clinket stories and then drawing parallels to other modes of, you know, mythology and, and theology. And so, um, so I was, uh, I, you know, so we did pick up that conversation later. I invited him to, um, to write an essay for the first exhibition that I had for the Museum of Glass. Um, and so he did, and so he, that's when we really got to know each other. And he always encouraged me to get deeper into the symbolism uh, of, you know, of the story. So this is going to be a lot about mythology, and it's going to be, uh, but it's also for the art students that are here. It's also part of a, you know, growth as as an artist and how, you know, the things that you the you come to a fork in the road and you decide to go left or right. I mean, I could have continued on my life as a happy little glass blower and just, you know, without, you know, working with my friends, it was great. But then when I sort, of, I said, well, I want to, I want to, you know, conjoin my my cultural background. Um, then uh, I took that left and, I, and I, I, I kind of separated myself from that community and I had to kind of, uh, well I didn't separate myself but mentally I had to refocus what I was doing. So um, I think we're all, we all come to that point in our lives when um, you know, we choose those paths and this for me was, led me to my ultimate success. So, um, um, uh, so, you know, I started to get to know Walter, uh, and right before we started to uh, embark on really putting it, you know, notes down on paper and, and designing this whole exhibition, Walter passed away. And um, I, you know, I was devastated. I didn't, you know, I didn't really know what I was going to do, but I knew that I had to carry on this process and I had to, uh, you know, persevere. And so uh, it took me a couple weeks or so, but I thought Miranda would be a great, uh, a great person to work with. You know, she comes from the same culture. Uh, she's, you know, very analytical, and I'd like to have her focus on my work and this story. What, you know, how, how can we do this together? So that's what we did. Um, so uh, kind of in a nutshell. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, Let's see, so in that process, you know, we started to talk about, um, 
the story. And the thing about it is that, you know, the Northwest Coast art, Alaska Native art, a lot of, a lot of Native cultures, um, intellectual property is, uh, is a really big deal, especially in Alaska. It's, you know, these, these stories come from specific families and they, they this, this particular story is a very, very old one that Clinkett would say, since time immemorial, this story has been here. It's this, this story uh, that is shared um, and uh, it's become a little bit more, I'd say a little bit more in the public domain. It's a very well-known story. So that's why I wanted to illustrate it in the way that I did based on all of the experience that I had uh, as a glass maker and, uh, and then getting into the, the narration of the story. And because it is a very well-known story, there's been a lot of both native and non-native interpretations of it in children's stories and in um, academic literature and as we were going through it you know we started finding more and more versions that were from Clinkett perspectives and we found versions that were written in um, that were only recorded and had to be um, transcribed into Clinkett and then translated into English because both Preston and I are not fluent um, Clinkett speakers and so it's a very endangered language and we're predicted to lose our um, fluence, our last fluent speaker by 2050. And so right now there is an emergency um, to save our language and we just opened up our first immersion kindergarten uh, in Juneau, Alaska. And so we're really excited about that. <laughs> and so we relied on a lot of different people, you know, the ancestors mm -hmm. in the past that were telling these stories that had the forethought to let somebody record them. And then for the people that are diligently working um, to learn the orthography, so that way um, in, in the standard uh, linguistic um, orthography, so that way they can write it. And so that way we can, have, we can get the sounds right. There's, um, I think, seven sounds in the Tlingit language that are not spoken in English. So you have to train your, your voice and your mouth to do things that we just don't know how to do when we only grow up speaking English. And there's three sounds that are um, spoken in Tlingit that are not spoken anywhere in the world. And so thinking about the power of the language and the power that is conveyed through these stories was really incredible um, aspect for us. And as we started finding more and more of the stories that were translated um, and working with different people that had translated the stories, you know, finding these details was just really helped shape and craft the narrative that we wanted to tell. And also brought to light details that we didn't even know before in our common knowledge of what of this story that is very, very popular and very well known. And details like um, before, you know, sometimes you'll run into it, it'll say, um, the title of the story will be Raven Steals the Sun. And that's only true in some of the stories. And in other stories, it's him releasing the sun, which is a very different connotation than stealing. But it depends on who is telling the story. And ultimately, we came to the conclusion that every single telling of the story is true for the person that's telling it. And we see this in different interpretations of different spiritual texts. Um, all around the world, you know, and so when we think about our convictions about what we know is true and what we think of as myth, um, there's a, a fantastic museum in Lansing, Michigan. If you ever get to go see um, the Zeboing, oh, see, excuse me, Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Um, so if you ever get to go see the Zeboing Center uh, of Anishinaabe Lifeways and Culture, please go check it out. And one of their main their main posters as you walk in and experience their creation of the world. It says all creation stories are true. And if you go in with that mindset and you just accept that that is somebody's reality, I mean, that's how we started going when we were finding these conflicting um, details in the story that was essentially the same. And so that was one way that we um, approached creating the narrative because we had some stories that said steal the light, some said release the light. And in those very fine granular details, we really helped shape the, the exhibit that you see upstairs that is just 
um, a stunning display. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, Walter was an amazing speaker. I mean, he did it without any visuals. I need my visuals uh, to tell this story. Uh, he he uh, um, he often. Uh, encouraged me to get into the symbolism. He said, you know, your work is so uh, attractive and, and people are drawn to it, you know, and I think you have this real, this power to share, you know, our culture more widely. And he said, um, you know, it's, it's, you have to be careful not to, to get into the trappings of this, you know, luscious material. Um, it's sort of like, you know, the hula dancers in Hawaii. You know, they've got these beautiful women in these grass skirts and these men are doing these, but they're, she goes, they're telling a story. They're telling a story. So you don't, that says, so be less like the hula dancer, but get into the symbolism, the myth, mythology. So this is uh, an experiment in doing that. This, this first object was, uh, um, you know, that represents the story. You know, there's the raven there. He's got the sun, you know, he's holding the sun. Um, but I will say, you know, so a little bit of a, uh, a narrative of, of what we're, we're going to go through here. In the beginning of time, the world is in darkness, and uh, the raven is a white bird. So in Native American, uh, most Native American cultures, uh, indigenous cultures, uh, uh, an albino animal um, is always thought of as a, a supernatural being. It's, uh, it's a sort of a spirit of that animal. So uh, you see it. Uh, you see albino animals in pretty much every species. And so, um, so this is this is how the story starts. And the world is in darkness. It's a, and it's a very confusing time. Um, because nobody can see anything, and people are, you know, picking up pebbles off the flo- off the ground, thinking that there are berries. And so this is a time where, where um, you know, that there was a lot of, um, uh, you know, confusion in the world. And so the raven goes to the fishermen of the night, and he goes to them and asks, "Where is the daylight?" Um, and the fishermen tell him of uh, an old man who lives at the head of the Nas River, and uh, he's, he's got the daylight in his clan house. So this is my you know, metaphor of the, the fishermen, the, their canoe and the fish there, um, these canoe paddles, and the fish themselves. <laughs> um, and so, um, so he, uh, you know, so he goes to this old man uh, and asks if he can come uh, in to see his treasures, and um, he's not allowed. So he, uh, you know, he doesn't want to have anything to do with Raven because he's maybe heard that he's, uh, you know, a shifty, a shifty fellow. Um, he, but the the old man is also, uh, or the Raven is told that the old man has a daughter. Um, a beautiful daughter who is transparent. And this is one detail that we learned through speaking with uh, someone who had studied the stories uh, a lot. And I didn't even, I hadn't really heard that part of it, so I made a, a transparent female figure here. Um, and again, that the significance of that is that this person is of supernatural, you know, uh, a supernatural powers or being of some sort. We didn't know until, till later. Do you want to explain the um, hat form? Um, yeah, and so the the hat form here. Um, traditionally, these hats are made out of out of uh, basketry weaving, um, so that's why I put the texture on there to make it look as if it's uh, you know it's woven, and the pot the rings that are on top that cylinder that's on top is um, signifies a person of high status. Um, it means that they had hosted a potlatch ceremony, uh, maybe up to four times. Maybe that some it's one uh, account says that you get a ring for each potlatch that you hold that you host. But um, some of them we see they're like woven together like an accordion, so that we're not really sure um, if that's really the truth or not. But so. Um, at least from my research, I haven't gotten that gone that far. <laughs> um, 
But, you know, potlatch is a very specific kind of ceremony, which, you know, the Clinket tribe is split into two moieties. There's the eagle and the raven. And so under each moiety, there's, there's family symbols. Like, for instance, mine is the killer whale. I come from the Kaguantan house group. Um, the brown bear and the wolf are also part of my family uh, symbolism. Um, and, you know, still matrilineal from my mother to my great-grandmother and so on. Um, uh, and so, anyways, so this <laughs> denotes that she's of high status. Um, is there anything that you wanted to add along these, this little passage here? Well, and we um, understand that in, you know, hosting this first show in Tacoma, you know, there's a lot of folks that would recognize the symbolism that this is a, a woman of high rank. Another way that you can tell the high rank is her lip piercing, um, denoting that she is somebody who can speak publicly because even though we're a matrilineal society, we're also patriarchal in our leadership. And so the men were the ones that were the public speakers, unless the woman had a high enough rank, um, had achieved a high enough rank. Uh, and there's a variety of ways to do that, and, but for her being the daughter of this very um, wealthy and powerful man, she, had, she was born into that rank. And so we do have this acknowledgement of lineage and the importance of lineage in uh, Clinket society and many Northwest Coast, many indigenous societies. And we're not uh, egalitarian at all, <laughs> uh, contrary to what a lot of anthropologists say about pre-contact native communities, we do have social status, social rank. And so then looking at this woman, um, if you're familiar with the trappings of how we denote social status, you could tell right away from her fine clothing um, because only, only people with a lot of wealth could afford to be the weavers or could hire somebody to be the weavers to make a garment that fine. Um, her libre showing that she could speak publicly and then also the hat showing this. So all of these are indicators of, of wealth and status and um, every indigenous community has these but making sure that we were making it clear that for a Clinket society, you're looking at some very big wigs, big, <laughs> biggest wigs. <laughs> and so they, um, making sure that they were part of that entryway was very important to setting the stage of, okay, Raven had to find his way into this house and he knew from all of these different indicators that were told in all these various stories that these were very important high-ranking people. And that is something that continues into our, into our cultural communities today. Not all the potlatch rings, not all the labre piercings, not the one that will stretch the lip, but you do see the women with the piercings still. The facial tattoos indicating um, what people's roles are in the community, the, that's another tradition that's coming back today, uh, which was something that was that had stopped and kind of went dormant for a long time, but it's making its way back now also. Yeah. So um, moving on in the story, <coughs> so, uh, so the, the Raven f basically f uh, formulates a plan and he, uh, so uh, he, he has the ability to transform. He transforms himself into a speck of dirt and the daughter is told that the daughter goes out in, uh, every morning to drink from this water source, this little stream or spring. And, and so, um, but because she's of noble class, she has uh, attendants with her. And so what happens is uh, she scoops up the water, and, um, but the attendants take a feather and they draw it through the water uh, to test the purity of it. And in this case, they find this little speck of dirt, which this is Raven here, uh, inside this little water droplet. So they cast out the water. And um, it was really interesting, one of the insights that, that Walter, when he would you know, command the stage and you know, be talking, um, he would get the audience involved and he'd say, you know, it was like, a, what, what, what is it about water? What's this, what is behind the symbol of water? What, is, what do you guys think? What do you think? And everybody would be like. 
quiet. <laughs> and then someone would, you know, blurt out, it's like, oh, well, it's, you know, it, it you know, gives us nutrition. We need their bodies. We're, we're you know, we're 90% water, whatever, what are we? Uh, but anyway, so, and, and so he also talked about, like, the purification. We use water for purification uh, to cleanse ourselves. We use water for... Uh, so that the fact that the water was dirty, you know, this was in his mind, his parallel was the, the uh, uh, talking about the purity, the purification, which ties into the, the American Indian sweat lodge ceremony. We use the, the vapor, you know, to, to, to sweat out the impurities in our body and to, to purify ourselves. So, um, so and, you know, in religious ceremonies, people are baptized, they're using, use water. Um, so on and on and on. Um, uh, I'm trying to channel my best, Walter. Um, so uh, so anyway, so his first plan fails, right? So um, he reformulates his plan. This time he transforms himself into a hemlock needle. And so this is the way that I illustrated. Raven is deconstructing himself and you know co- you know breaking down his into to become uh, this this hemlock needle. And this time he floats down the river, or the water, uh, and uh, the daughter scoops it up, and they don't see it this time. It's on the edge of the cup or the ladle, and so she swallows this water, and she swallows the hemlock needle. And then immediately she realizes, oh, I've I've swallowed something, and she can feel it. Um, And so uh, doesn't really think anything of it, but then she becomes, she becomes pregnant. So she becomes uh, pregnant, and uh, which is quite, you know, uh, surprising for her family. She has no <laughs> husband. Um, and so, uh, you know, another point that Walter liked to, to bring up was this is like, it's, it's akin to the, the Immaculate Conception, you know. And he would always say this, he was, you know, he, he went to church and he went, he read the Bible and he found parallels between theology and he says, you know, he goes, it's like, I, I you know, and I don't, I, I, you know, I don't want to dis- disrespect anybody who, uh, you know, goes to church or any Catholics, Christians, he said that, he says, but I don't want to feel that people can hog God all to themselves or <laughs> Jesus all to themselves. So, so we use that metaphor. That, that is something that we, we talk about. And I think uh, that's another interesting you know, point of contention that we, we, um, we kept encountering. People was like, well, you can't say that. And yeah. so R- Miranda had to uh, you know, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, and um, going over all of these different texts, you know, we used five different versions of the Raven and the Box of Daylight story um, from four different Clinket storytellers and from different ages, from different villages, from different regions. And uh, some of them are uh, no longer living. And so we weren't able to ask them themselves. But the ways that uh, we wanted to respect the words that they used um, in in crafting the narrative that you encounter upstairs and in the catalog. And so when they use certain descriptors or certain terms, we, we tried to honor that. And um, knowing that Walter, you know, one of his jobs was um, he was a folklorist and he was a historian. And so he looked at, you know, multiple religions and studied multiple religions all around the world to find the ways that um, our stories, our Clinket stories, reflected were reflected and were echoed in different parts of the world. And so, using um, as another way of honoring Walter's telling of it was um, for us to use the terminology of immaculate conception in the in the exhibit. And um, it was interesting that we we didn't get um, a lot of pushback at first. And then as more people sat with it and sat with it, they said, wait a minute, that's not how it is over here. And we said, we know. Um, (laughs) But those are the words that were used by our elders and we are honoring our elders, we're honoring our ancestors. 
and crafting a new narrative that honors our shared humanity. And so um, that was really our intention behind using very specific language like Immaculate Conception in the exhibit. Yeah. You know, another, another point that Walter brought up is that we can use these words that, you know, I mean, if I say the word karma, everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? They, they, so we can use that word and we can infer a context and therefore everybody's more or less on the same page. So, so by, by saying this was also, um, you know, gave us, you know, a tremendous amount of pride in terms of like, oh, our stories have all of these metaphors. And that's what Walter really told me, the symbolism behind the story is as on par with any of the great Joseph Campbell kinds of perspectives and uh, breaking down the archetypes of a particular story and, you know, the Wizard of Oz is Star Wars. It's the same story, you know, it's the same story. It just keeps going and going and going. But within the context of these stories, we learn uh, a lot of symbolism. So on with the story, um, he, he, so finally he gets into the, um, into the clan house. Um, uh, wait. No, I'm sorry. She hasn't been born yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, uh, Raven hasn't been born, uh, but he is transforming inside the, the body of the woman, the young woman, um, and he is born into this world. She becomes pregnant, um, and so here is, you know, Raven, hybrid sort of, uh, uh, or um, um, sort of, uh, losing my words, I'm trying to use too many words. Um, Part. Yeah, 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 sure. And so then when, uh, in some of the stories, when he's um, in the water and, you know, it's, he's either being drunk or being cast out, um, in some of the stories, she doesn't notice anything at all, and she just drinks the water and then uh, becomes pregnant. And in some of the stories, um, she says, there's something in my water, and her mom says, just drink it. Just drink the water already. It's just like it, it just resonated so much as a parent. <laughs> I'm like trying to get my kid to do something. I'm like, just do it. And then later on, they get hurt or something like that. And I was thinking, oh man, her mom in that story. Like, what is her mom feeling knowing she told her to drink the water? There's no way to know in the moment, but just recognizing that that was such a mom moment of the mom saying, just drink the water already. And she did, and she was like, there's something in my throat. She goes, just, well, then drink some more water. You know, and <laughs> it was just such a, a parent-kid moment that was embedded in that version of the story, and I wish that we could have shared more details, but again, trying to find that through line that Patricia spoke of was really important, and so we had to leave a lot of really fun details out like that, um, but they were totally there. <laughs> um, so humanoid, that's what I was trying to say. This is a humanoid sort of, you know, you can see it's becoming, taking a uh, human form. He's got this raven nose or beak here. Um, so uh, this part of the story is that, you know, so uh, she's pregnant, this daughter, um, transparent woman who has no name. I have no idea why she has no name, but that's part of the detail of the story. So she... Um, she is uh, trying to give birth, and in the old days, what they would do is they would create a birthing area. Um, they would dig a, a bit of a, a pit out behind the, in, behind the clan house, and they would line it with these furs. Um, uh, and so the, the woman would then give birth with, to the child on these furs, and she's having a hard time giving birth, the baby's not coming out. And uh, so uh, a medicine woman passes by and says, oh, um, well, I feel that though, as though the, the child doesn't want to be born on these uh, fine furs, you know, this is uh, of a noble class. So she said, take uh, goat's beard moss and replace the furs with goat's beard moss. And so once, once they did that, um, then the baby came easily. So um, the baby uh, is born on this uh, um, less than luxurious um, 
um, you know, uh, condition, uh, you know, on the fine furs. And another point that Walter would bring out was that is as if, you know, uh, Jesus was born in a stable. And, and so he didn't have uh, this illustrious birth in, in a fine location. So, uh, so anyway, another sort of biblical tie in there. But there, so this is the, how I illustrated, you know, Raven transforming into this human. And this is in the exhibition, the, the, uh, the trying to animate the idea of this transition from, uh, you know, from the bird to human form. So we've seen that piece upstairs. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so now he's, uh, anything more there? Um, so now he's, uh, he's in the clan house. That's the only way that he was able to get into the clan house. Um, and so this is uh, essentially representing the clan house here and these uh, house posts that represent ancestral, um, you know, uh, lineage and high status, of course. Um, so the old man, um, you know, has all these, uh, you know, these objects in his clan house and um, so this is him, this is his wife. So, try to bring a little bit more human uh, presence into the into the scenario here. Um, so he's presiding over these objects, these these treasures that he owns, and in Clinket we call it at u, um, these things that are um, made uh, to symbolize the family, sim the, the fam family crest symbols. Um, th sometimes these objects would. Yeah, it could be a hat. It could be, uh, you know, a um, uh, an object. You know, a rattle, a mask. Um, these things. Were, there are certain things that were kept, and they were kept um, as heirlooms for to be passed on to the next generation to continue telling the stories of you know of the culture. You know, so where way of sharing um, information. Um, and so these things, uh, the, on the wall is another very significant uh, form. Uh, this was called a tina. It was also sometimes referred to as a money piece uh, and also denoted high status of an individual. And you know, there's um, often, so, there's examples of these tinas that were broken up in a ceremony uh, to, and, and given to other people, other clans during a potlatch ceremony, which is where all the all the tribal politics were were uh, straightened out, you know, inter-clan um, uh, sort of favors and restitution were paid during these ceremonies in a big public, you know, forum. Uh, names were given to the children. The you know totem poles were erected in the in the honor of deceased uh, chiefs or uh, illustrating a particular story that belongs to that clan. Um, so that's where all this ceremony would come together. Uh, and this is the, you know, the potlatch system. And this is where all the songs were sung and all of the stories were retold and all the dances were performed. And, um, and so, so now Raven is inside and he's looking at all these things. He, uh, um, you know, he is, a very mischievous child and he is precocious and he's always, you know, sneaking around and looking and playing with everything. And um, so he comes, um, he comes across these uh, boxes. Where are the boxes? Oh, there's the, yeah. Um, one of the ways that we really wanted to honor um, our ancestors also was to um, mimic and replicate um, photographs that were taken in the late 1800s of clan houses on the Northwest Coast and a lot of times they were staged and so the photos that you see of uh, usually they only showed the men uh, because they were usually only interested in the men um, <laughs> but they um, they would have all of, of the clan pieces all of the house treasures all of the pieces that reflected who our families were, and um, they would put them all on one side of the house and stack them up in this very 
grand fashion and then have everybody stand around in their regalia, their, their traditional, their, you know, their very, very, their finest clothes and to make it look like they're just casually hanging out in their <laughs> finest clothes. Like, imagine putting all of your amazing art in your house on one side and then wearing your tuxedos and your ball gowns and then just like hanging out by them. <laughs> and so then that gives you a sense of how these photos were staged. And, um, but they're incredible because they just show this huge range of what people were doing at the time. And so the basketry, the carving, um, the clothing, the, the headdresses, the hats, everything was all in one photo. And so in that way, we're really lucky to have these um, photographs of that time. And so then in the clan house, when you walk down um, the, the, in the middle after you see the, the screen, that's what we're replicating there was to see the terrace steps um, of the way that they staged those photos in the clan houses. And so um, at the Museum of Glass, there were, it was one long display, and here you get to be surrounded by it on both sides. And so that's probably more of how it actually was, or it was scattered throughout the house. But um, that's what we were, that was our intention, you know, to show all, not just the wealth of the, the man and the wife, um, the Nashak Sankawu was the, the man at the head of the, the Nas River, but also to just show what their family owned um, as another one of those insider baseball things that say, oh, this we're in a very um, high-ranking noble person's home. So... Um so, you know, the raven, this child, is, um, he's always poking around and looking throughout the clan house, and he finds these boxes, um, and um, he starts to play with the box, you know, and he's, you know, being very coy about it, and he's just sitting over in the corner by himself, and no one's really paying attention to him, so he opens up this box, and it's the box that contains the stars. And so he, uh, he takes these stars and no one's looking. He tosses them up through the smoke hole in the center of the, of the clan house. And so these stars are, take their place in the heavens and they're there for, the, for you know, they're, they're uh, lost to the, the old man forever. So he um, realizes what's going on and he reprimands the child and he says, you know, that was wrong, you know. And, punishes him to some degree. And um, he, uh, so, you know, a couple days go by and uh, same thing, he comes across this other box and it's the, you know, starts to play with it and everybody's like, you know, keeping an eye on him. It's like, okay, he's got the box there, but we're not gonna say anything. And then finally, people wander off and they go get something that eat and some people go off to take a nap and then he opens up this box and it's the box that contains the, the moon. And so he takes this and he chucks it up through the smoke hole to take its place in the sky, in the heavens. And, um, you know, so this time, you know, the grandfather is really disappointed with him and he scolds him and he reprimands him and, you know, it's like, you know, then he, he kind of forgets about it. It's like, okay, well, it's, that's over. Um, but, you know, the child doesn't give up. He keeps looking. He's looking for the daylight, the box of sun. So he finally finds that third box. Do I have the, yeah, there's the, the stars, of course, and the moon. Um, so he finally comes across the last box, and um, everybody's like, okay, uh, you, can, uh, you can't have that one. <laughs> it's just you can't play with it, and so he, the child, just like throws a fit and he starts crying and you know jumping and up and down and screaming and you know it's like and he's on and on and on and on and on and on and you know for for hours and hours and hours and he's everybody's just like good lord you know it's, they're, they're driving everybody crazy. 
And you know, then he, you know, he stops eating, and he's, you know, the child ends up in bed, and he's really weak, and you know, and he's just like, oh. Uh, the daughter goes to her father and says, you know, grand, you know, father, is there anything more important than your grandson? And he says, oh yeah, perhaps you're right. So he says, puts the box down in front of the boy, and he says, okay, but don't open the box. <laughs> and so he, uh, you know, of course, you know, he's biding his time. And at this point, Raven's being, he's tired of being in human form. He's, he's really, he's just done with it. So he's finally has his eye on the final treasure. And so he transforms himself back into the bird and he takes the sun. And a lot of the stories, he carries it in his beak and the old man realizes immediately he's been fooled and he sees the bird and he grabs onto the tail and he's flapping away trying to get away and he's like really fighting and so the old man holds him over the the fire in the in the the central fire pit and the smoke from the fire is what turns raven black so he manages finally to to wriggle away and he gets up and he flies off with the daylight and the sun and then he, uh, he breaks daylight on the world. So there's the, the raven holding the sun. And so what happens is that um, this big flash of light in the world's in darkness, okay? So, he's, uh, so these people, um, they scatter. Some of them run off into the forest and they become the forest animals. Some of them run it, jump into the water, they become the sea life and some of them jump up into the sky and they become the birds and then um, the people who stood up and remained where they were became the human beings. And, and I love this too, there's another, uh, the two different versions of the story. I said, I said, yeah, the people that stood up strong and proud, they became the Clinket people, right? <laughs> and then uh, Miranda's like, or yeah, they were either that or they were, feebly like, you know, <laughs> bewildered by everything and they didn't know what to do. Uh, yeah, so, you know, there's, there's the contrast. There. And both of those versions are told in different stories. <laughs> and so it's either the praising ourselves for being strong and, clink and clinket and or just being too dumb to run. And so like, <laughs> We became the humans, and I really appreciated that detail that I was like, okay, well, we'll be strong and brave and clink it, but when it's we're dumb, we're humans. And so I was like, okay, here's another detail and where the words really matter in the storytelling. And um, so, um, you know, so, and, and one theory is these connections to the animal symbols, you know, where, um, you know, the, they were adopted as clan and crest symbols over time, um, you know, and as the uh, clan system developed, you know, and these, um, you know, different animals came to represent different people, uh, different groups of people, and so, um, uh, and in some cases, there's really supernatural um, events that happen, um, you know, with killer whales and with, you know, bears. And so there's several stories and there's uh, a lot of them are, again, they, they trace back to specific families. Um, and so this was just one uh, example of the, you know, pretty much the most, one of the most iconic uh, stories um, and it was really, really fun to work on. Um, tried to bring all of those, um, the whole experience into the exhibition in different ways. Um, it's the uh, salmon clan there. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, what else do we have to say about the story in general? Well, um, it was really, hard to decide which details to include and which details to leave out. And last night when we were talking about um, this with um, Dr. Heather Auton, who's a curator up in Oklahoma City, um, Chickasaw woman, 
and she was talking about how um, indigenous curators, indigenous artists, um, it's not just about the story that we present, but it's the agonizing uh, weight of what we're leaving out. And so um, I'm really glad that we're able to share this story here with you today so we can provide additional details that are not in the ex exhibition and they're not in the catalog. And so right now they're living in our brains and living in our minds. And so uh, if the purpose of knowledge is to pass it on, then uh, we are helping to pass that on and it's living in your memories, which is now um, part of your understanding of the exhibition. And that is now part of your responsibility as people who have been here today and are seeing the exhibition and are experiencing it to share some of those details with others who were not able to be here today. And that is that reciprocity is really one of the foundational aspects of Clinkett culture, of Northwest Coast culture, and it's the basis for the potlatch, it's the basis for our clan system, it's the basis for our entire philosophy and ways of life. And it's not just something that happened in the past, but today we're helping bring it to you so it's still living right now in the present and hopefully into the future. Um, I don't know how many more images I have. That might be the last one. Um, yeah. Um, got it. Two minutes. <laughs> All right. Oh, two images. Oh, two more images. Okay, there's one. Okay. I think it was getting the hook here. All right, you talked enough about that stuff. Um, yeah, you know, it, it, it was it was spending time with Walter was really amazing. I mean, talking about our culture, sharing our culture, it was like, you know, um, one of the most interesting things is completely unrelated to the story. But Walter said, you know, um, in in our culture, um, we talked a lot about a lot of things. He said, you know, um, uh, he says. Homicide wasn't the worst offense that uh, could be, uh, uh, you know, that 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 could be done in in the old days. So we had no had no prison systems. We had no we had no way of locking people up. But there was a responsibility for the for the people and their actions within your own clan. He said, "Okay, so if 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 I went, you know, to Miranda's clan, um, and and I and I." and I you know, would do something wrong to them. He says, worse than homicide was, um, was uh, gossip. He says, gossip was uh, because gossip creates instability within the community. And, um, and so if you think about it today, we're, we're a society that thrives on gossip, right? Okay, so we're, you know, we know a lot about you know, a lot of people, a lot of stars and politicians and what have you. But he said, so if, if, if I were to slander Miranda's family, then my clan would come together and they would, um, they would say, okay, you know, to Miranda's clan, you know, we understand that Preston has done something wrong. And so we would like to, uh, we're, we're coming together as a, as a community to apologize for that behavior. So we realize that he's done that he's done that. We're offering you now this, you know, this. We're paying you something, restitution. It could be uh, material objects or money of some sort, some sort of uh, exchange. And I said, so from this day forward, we will never talk about this again. So, but we're we're accepting responsibility for our clan member, our individual who did something wrong to you, slandered your family, or whatever it was. Um, so you think about that in context of today's world. I mean, where would we be? I think we'd be in a much different place if people would take responsibility for the things that they did wrong and, uh, you know, and the truth would come out. But um, anyways, just a crazy, funny little detail there. <laughs> um, and unless you, I don't know, do you have anything else to add to about the story or? Um, about the story. Well, um, I would just like to say thank you again to Patricia, to everybody here, 
on staff. Thank you to Preston for giving me one of the biggest um, opportunities of my career um, to be part of it and a chance to explore more about my own identity, um, a sliver of my identity. I'm also Zuni Pueblo from New Mexico and have done extensive research about my community in New Mexico, but through my curatorial work, I've been able to work in, you know, do extensive research on my mother's family and our, and the Clinket people in general, and it's just been fascinating, um, and I hope that everybody gets a chance to research their own communities, their own families, their own cultures, their own ethnicities, because it really does show how your worldview is shaped and if we can all understand that, you know, our communities have so much power that we don't even really think about consciously, you know, especially for kids. Um, there's an Apache philosopher named um, Viola Cordova who's passed on, but um, she talks about how we ha all have a matrix. We all have a way of seeing the world that as kids we have no control over. Kids, they, they know what we know because we tell them. But it's not until we become fully formed beings and adults that we, we have the luxury of being able to find out more about ourselves and about the world. And um, we find out more by finding out about ourselves first and then finding out about the world. Or we start to be able to compare, contrast, and it just enlightens us more and more and more. And so to be able to do that through an exhibition that is shared with so many people um, has just been very humbling experience. So thank you all for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like all right, shut up already. No. Um, uh, take, 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 take some questions. Yeah. I have just, you know, a couple more uh, things that I didn't really touch on that Walter uh, always would bring up. And, you know, it's, it's this whole story is actually, okay, the world's in darkness and, and Raven brings the light. Okay, so what's the metaphor of light? You know, what, uh, you know, say, say for instance, you know, what happens when, you know, a, a comic book character gets a, an idea, pops into the head, what happens? A little light bulb pops up, right? And so, uh, and, and so, uh, what about like if if uh, a student goes into school and, and they don't they don't understand something very clearly, and they go to the 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 teacher and they ask the teacher to shed light on the subject, you know? So this idea of light and dark and all of this stuff, um, you know, Raven brings the light, Jesus is the light. There's, I mean, there's all these things that are universal metaphors. And so those are the kinds of uh, a really interesting thing. In this story, there's, um, you know, there's stories, uh, there is um, the element of forgiveness from the, 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 the grandfather to the grandson. You know, he forgives him of all of these things that he does and all this mischievous stuff, uh, losing the treasures. And then, um, um, you know, we talked about purity in water. Um, uh, yeah. what, what else? Well, in the, the, the strength of family ties, you know, and that commitment to family and commitment to family happiness, even if it's to your own detriment. Um, there's a, a Clinket um, novelist and author named, um, ah, now I just blanked on her name. She wrote a book called um, The Tao of Raven. Ernestine Hayes is her Ernestine, name. Yeah. Uh, Ernestine Hayes is her name, and her second memoir is called The Tao of Raven. And in it, she goes between memoir and also the story of Raven in the Box of Daylight. And in the story, because she's such a gifted writer, you can't quite tell if this is somebody in her family that she's talking about, or if this is a fictional character that is maybe based on somebody in her family. But in one point in her telling, um, she talks about a, a grandmother who would do anything for this grandchild that is just struggling in life, is just struggling, 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 and hurts his grandmother over and over by stealing from her, by um, you know breaking her trust, all of these different ways that he hurts his grandmother, not physically, but you know he, he's just hurting her. And then she relates that to 
what must that grandfather have felt when he realized that he had been duped by his favorite person in the world, you know, the, the grandson. And so that really affected um, how I thought about the exhibition. And when we're talking about this forgiveness that is embedded in the narrative that you read upstairs, you know, this idea that the grandparent would do anything for the grandchild. And of course, parents would do anything for their child, but it's a whole nother level with grandchildren. <laughs> I'm, I'm told, <laughs> and I've witnessed that the, the forgiveness factor for grandparents and grandchildren is just something that's not there for the grandparents and the and for parent and child. And so to think about how the the grandfather must have been so deeply hurt by the actions of the grandchild um, really brought in this idea of forgiveness of how he was able to forgive and forgive after um, the, the stars went up in the sky and then the moon went up in the sky. And that forgiveness is what allowed him to give the grandchild his ultimate, what was his ultimate treasure before the grandchild be, came into his life is the box of daylight. And so um, different, different factors you know, really played a role in the shaping of this exhibition, you know, not just the historical ones, but again, present day writers. I mean, Ernestine, she's Dr. Hayes, uh, excuse me, she's a professor at the University of Alaska and, you know, is writing these fantastic books that you should definitely read and think about as you're experiencing this, this exhibit. Mm -hmm. <coughs> a question? Three, three questions. Three questions. Sure. Um, I'm from Seattle. They're uh, on the, the, the west coast uh, of Alaska, like the southern, they call it southeast, which is interesting because it's like the westernmost area on that area, but as far as the, 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 the state, the southeast is here on the coast above uh, British Columbia. Yeah, from about Ketchikan on up to Yakutat would be the... That's true. Um, it takes two or three times longer to, to, to do the design work and the, and the uh, etching, sandblasting into the glass. So yeah, it's, uh, but I have, I mean, today I've, I'm pretty lucky to have um, some long-term assistance people, uh, two uh, assistants that have been working with me like 12 to 15 years. So um, that's the only way that I could achieve so much uh, you know, execute so much work, you know, would be to have uh, people helping me. Mm -hmm. Yes? So, could, what do you think of the symbolism of Raven turning from white to black? Is there something in that? Or is it just a way to explain why Ravens are black? Yeah, I don't, I don't, hadn't really given that much thought, but there's the, just kind of how he transformed. Uh, yeah, it, it's both. You know, so then um, part of it is in some of the stories when he's, um, it, it does explain how ravens are black, you know, and there's a lot of explanatory trickster stories, you know, and Raven is a trickster. He's not God, but when he's a white being, he does have this ability to shift. And so in a lot of native communities, indigenous communities, they call them shapeshifters. You know, in the Navajo um, community down in New Mexico, in the southwestern region, shapeshifter um, has a really negative connotation. It means somebody who is involved in witchcraft. Um, in other times, there's tricksters like uh, Cherokee has rabbit. You know, rabbit, a lot of times coyote is a trickster. And a lot of times, um, they are operating in a world, you know, it's a time before time. So it's in this mythic time where things are very loose and fluid and they can, they're responsible for shaping the earth as we know it. So then in, in sometimes they, but because they have this ability, there are also consequences to their actions. And so in some stories, that's Raven's consequence is that he loses that ability to be a shapeshifter, you know, once his, that, that uh, once he's turned black and covered in soot. And we had to be very careful about that too, about um, reifying very colonial ideas about 
well, you know, he was good when he was white and now he's bad because he's black or he's punished and he becomes black. And we had to be very conscious of that, um, that yes, it is part of why he's a black bird, but we didn't want to, you know, at one point I thought about having all Clinket language at the beginning and then shifting it into English at the end. And I was like, wait a minute, we're talking about enlightenment. A lot of our source of strength as Clinket people comes from our language. And so what are we losing, all of us? Now, one of the artists that I worked with, Allison Marks, she's talking about emojis on our phones and how now we have this universal pictorial language that we can use on our phones, but what are we giving up in our ability to express ourselves if we say, oh, this really bad thing happened to me and you send back, oh, it's like <laughs> sad face. Instead of saying, I'm so sorry this happened to you. Can I, can, how can I support you? You know, like we just send back, <laughs> And like, well, what are we losing if we go towards a universal language? If we are moving that way, even in, in the pictorial language, like text emojis, you know, what are we saying in the messaging of that? And so we really focus on having the language integrated throughout. And then also bringing in the music of Kui, um, Preston's band. So when you hear the music of Sarah's, you know, a lot of that was created by Preston. And so then making sure that we are, and also acknowledging that sometimes uh, stories were recorded by anthropologists and ethnographers that had their own uh, viewpoints on how they were interpreting um, indigenous stories, uh, which is something that still happens. And so um, making sure to really privilege the the clinket ideas that we were encountering was what we tried to do. So to answer your question, it's, it's both. <laughs> yeah. I didn't told you this, but I was in uh, Alaska. Uh, it was Paul Marks, and he was, I met him in a coffee shop, just bumped into him, and he was an elder. <clears throat> I was talking, I was like, I, you know, since I've been losing <laughs> elders and people that I work with, people who, you know, share with me, inform me about the the culture and stuff, and I, somebody I can have you know a dialogue with. Um, I said, hey, could I could I speak to you? You know, can I get your phone number? We could talk, you know, once in a while. And he was like, so he started like talking about this over his cup of coffee and wor whatever work he was doing. He goes, you know, Raven, Raven was a man. He had the name Raven, but he was a man. He said, he said. Uh, there's a story of like, you know, Raven goes out and picks up this big skunk cabbage and he wraps it up in his, in, you know, a piece of fish. He goes, Raven can't do that. It was a man. And I was just like, okay, wait, hold on a sec. Uh, you're telling me Raven's a man. Okay, so this story is so, you know, sort of put that in context. I thought that was really interesting and surprising uh, way of, you know, talking about it that I hadn't thought about before. <laughs> yes. I have a question about the canoe. Is that one piece or is it two It's two pieces of glass that have been sort of water jet cut and slumped into a form and then the steel, the center is this piece of steel, the armature that holds it together. Yeah. Thank you. How about over here? Um, your exhibit is so colorful. Is there a symbolism to the color? Yeah. The red or blue. Why is Raven as a piece of dirt? Uh, I just wanted to look a little. Uh, I wanted it to sparkle. I wanted to look, you know, like a little glint, like there's some spirit or energy inside that little speck. You know, so it was a very special color that we have that um, has that sort of. It was called a venturine. It's like a um, a glass that's made to look like the venturine stone. Yeah. Red, blue. What's that? Red, blue. Why is red? Why is red? Uh, well, this red, 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 and red and black are the two colors that are very typical. You know, they come from natural pigments. So, a lot of the older material you'll see are, you know, have you know either an ochre red, black, you know, from, um, you know, uh, charcoal from the fire and mixed with you know uh, salmon eggs and whatever. Yeah. So those are some. That's that's part of why it's all uh, red is. And then there's the blue. Um, 
is you know made from a copper uh, copper deposit that was also formulated into a paint. So that's why those colors. Yep. Over there. Yeah, yeah. His his uh, his name is Yech, Yech. Yeah, that's how you pronounce the his name in Clinket. Yeah. Over there. Mm. You know, with all color. Yeah. With all things. Yeah, perhaps, yeah. He, I mean, it's just kind of how, what, you know, what, what uh, helped, what caused him to transform mm -hmm. into the form that we see today. This is, so that's, I mean, it's a, a lot of these stories, I think, are meant to sort of capture the imagination. I mean, the, Walter talked a lot about the whole, the power of imaging, you know, and even Joseph Campbell talks about this, you know, the, the stories that are the oral traditions and the mythologies. You know, first of all, what, what is mythology? We, we often think mythology is something that is untrue, right? Oh, that's a myth, right? So we call them mythologies, but then, um, uh, you know, uh, these, uh, it, it, once you hear the story over and over again, um, if you didn't have visuals, if I didn't have these things, everybody would be thinking about what I was saying. And you may picture it in a completely different way. So this power of imaging is actually a, a very powerful tool that we are essentially losing. You're talking about the emoji kind of analogy. Those things, uh, we're, we're, we're losing certain aspects of, of, our, of our humanity. These things that we should, you know. Um, I mean, Joseph Campbell talked about uh, how utter, utterly important it was to have storytelling and these, these mythologies that were shared and, and understanding the symbolism and how to break them down and understand them. Yes? Could you explain moiety? Uh, well, the moieties of uh, the Clinket tribe is, um, you know, you, you're born into your mother's uh, moiety. It's either, it used to be the wolf and the raven, and then it, at some point it became eagle. It shifted and became the two main moieties. Under each moiety, there's different clan symbols, but you're born into your mother's uh, moiety, and, you, and you're the, the property of the mother. There's no paternity disputes because you are the property of the mother. And by tribal law, you would marry over to the other side. So my family is our, our eagles, and so by tribal law, I must marry over, I can't marry another eagle, I have to marry a raven. And it just so happens my raven came from the other side of the globe, from Sweden. <laughs> She's definitely not an eagle, she was uh, a raven. And uh, well, she's typically, uh, technically she's not a raven because she's not adopted. I could go through the, the, the um, the process of having her adopted, which would then validate my children. My children don't actually carry um, a crest symbol because my crest, you know, they would have to have a raven crest symbol. So um, anyway, it was, it was the part of the reason for uh, doing that was to keeping the bloodlines pure. You know, they weren't intermarrying, you know, within, within your own moiety, so. Okay. Yeah. We're going to yeah. call that an afternoon. Um, <laughs> I, I know there's some more questions. Please bring them up to uh, Preston to the podium. Uh, honored to have both of you here and have this show here. So I'm going to reiterate Miranda's challenge to all of us. Please tell your friends and your neighbors and your family about this very special exhibition that we have at the Wichita Art Museum. I really see that for any art museum, but for our art museum in Wichita, um, it's important to bring the world of art here, and I think we've done that so beautifully with this particular project that Preston and Miranda have put together. So go spread the word. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Right.